Presented by Caltech. We're thrilled to have you here today at our 80th Annual Seminar Day and to celebrate the 2017 Distinguished Alumni Awards. I'm Ira Muscatel, class of 1972, and I've had the honor to serve as this year's Seminar Day Chair. I'd like to thank and acknowledge the Seminar Day Committee and ask them to please stand. How many are out there? I also want to thank the tremendous staff of the Alumni Association who did all the real heavy lifting for this program today. We merely had to work with the speakers and a little bit on, on making sure the topics were right and in the right places. Not Not only are our faculty enlightening us today, Caltech graduate students and even undergraduate students play a vital role in the research of the Institute and are very articulate in communicating that research. Graduate students step into spotlight sessions during the three o'clock and four o'clock sessions and you'll get a chance to hear outstanding undergraduates in the Surf Lecture Series winners sessions at four o'clock. You should all seriously consider going to hear these examples of the next generation of scientists and engineers from Caltech. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Eric Betzig. How does one introduce a Nobel Prize winner? I've been intrigued by the various paths he's taken. Not quite straight in line. I think we've seen that multiple times. After receiving his bachelor's degree here in physics in 1983, he went on to Cornell to complete a PhD, developing techniques in near-field optics for breaking the Abbe diffraction limit for optical microscopy. Then on to Bell Labs, where he applied his knowledge and creativity to a wide variety of imaging and other technologies. When Bell Labs was beginning to change, Dr. Betzig decided to leave it to become vice president of engineering of his father's machine tool company, where he worked to develop high-speed motion control technology. An engineering, but not a commercial success. Undaunted, his next venture also started outside of academia or large corporations but returned him to his focus on seeing the smallest things. With another Bell Labs expatriate, he developed super resolution palm technology, proving that things other than software and microcomputers can be built and tested on a living room table. Not long afterwards, he joined the Genelia Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In 2014, he shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Stefan Hell and William Murner for using fluorescent molecules to bypass the Abbe limit. He was named a distinguished alumnus of Caltech last year. Today, he is going to share with us the history and his perspective of how the developments in technology to see the most distant bodies in space have made it possible to see the most minute features within our own bodies. Please welcome Dr. Eric Betzig. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. So um, ever since humans were able to look beyond their immediate survival, they started to wonder what was their place in the universe. How far away are the stars how small is the smallest thing that there is? And so today we know a lot about how to answer those questions. If we took ourselves and we shrunk ourselves down by about a factor of a billion, we would be about the size of the individual nucleotides in our own DNA. But on the other hand, if we blew ourselves up by a factor of a billion, we would only be about at the orbit of the moon. So in other words, about as far as humans have been able to travel so far. But as you'll note, that's far from the entire universe. And in fact, you would have to go up another factor of a trillion 
before you got to the size of our local group of galaxies. And that's less than one ten thousandth of the entire size of the observable universe. And so if it's easy to think in our everyday lives when we're flying in a plane or we're living in a city that we're significant or on some scale. But we are a tiny little film of, of scum on a little pebble in a vast emptiness. And it is hard to emotionally appreciate exactly how precious we are because of the fact of our insignificance in that large vastness. So, so all of that's fine, and so that's what we know today, but how did we get here? How did we go from those people who were, who were just starting to think to, to the knowledge we have now? Because after all, our initial tool was just our own senses, and particularly our own eyes. Well, our eyes are the tool we see to look for things either small or big, and we do that by changing the shape of our cornea. And if we make it so that our, our corneas have a, a, a shorter focal length and we look up close, we can see down to about a human hair, but that's still about 50,000 times bigger than a molecule. On the other hand, if we look far out in the distance, we can see stars, but we see them as points, and the planets look like points. And in particular, the best resolution that we can get with our own eyes is 50 times too coarse to see Neptune as more than a point, as a disk. And so the one thing, though, that's common in both of these regimes is that our ability to see better, either at the small scale or the big scale, depends on the size of the pupil of our eye. And so that's what limits our ability to get a better picture of the universe. So how do we then know everything else that I described in that first slide? It's because we make instruments that have bigger pupils that can collect light from more angles that have better resolution. And so when we're looking small, we call those instruments microscopes. When we're looking distant, we call those instruments telescopes. But in either case, the goal is to try to make it to collect as much light from as many angles as possible to get both the most signal and to get the best resolution. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we came from our initial understanding to today. And it started a little more than 400 years ago in the late 16th century when Zacharias Janssen put two lenses together to create something to be able to look down at the small scale. That was the start of the compound microscope. A couple years later, legend has it that a spectacle maker named Hans Lippershey had took, there were two kids who stole a couple of his uh, spectacle lenses and then were playing with them outside here and looked at a weather, weather vane through a pair of them and was able to see the weather vane much better. And so that was his eureka moment and he said, aha, and he put those two things together in a tube they call that the Dutch perspective glass, which we now know as the telescope. And that took Europe by storm because surveyors, uh, sailors, everybody wanted this instrument. One of the first guys to hear about this was Galileo Galilei. And then he started to make his own telescopes, first to 3x, but then way beyond other people, he got up to a 30x telescope. And when he turned that to the heavens, he just started making discoveries left and right. He was able to show that there were four little points orbiting around the point that was Jupiter in the sky. And so he would found the Galilean satellites that we know today. He was able to show that the moon isn't smooth but has a rough cratered surface with, with mountains. And he was able to show that the Venus goes through all of the different phases from full to new over the course of the years. And so in particular, two of those discoveries led him into hot water because um, he, he uh, wrote a book um, basically in support of the heliocentric model, which basically results from those observations, um, got into trouble with the church, agreed that he would be quiet about it, um, but then he wrote a second book, which basically almost made fun of the pope in the way he described it, called uh, um, on, the two, on the Two Chief World S Systems of Viewing the World, and then led to house arrest. So it just shows that you know, if you're a great scientist, and there's probably no greater scientist in history than Galileo, your ultimate reward is house arrest. So, uh, <laughs> but um, what I should say for everything I'm about to say in this talk, if you guys have time, a few miles from here is the Huntington Library. Almost everything I'm going to talk about in this talk in the history 
of this discovery, the original manuscripts and so forth are in that library. It's well worth your time to go. So um, microscopy started to play catch up. So Galileo was about 1610, and this is a common theme that you're going to hear in my talk, is that I'm a microscopist, so I can say this without offending anybody, but microscopists are the retarded stepchildren of astronomers. <laughs> and so astronomers figure everything out first, and then 50 years later, we steal it from them. Okay, so, so um, finally, 50 years after, after the compound telescope is really taking off, there was really nothing happening much in microscopy until the 1660s when Robert Hooke came on the scene. So Hooke was a real polymath. His, his misfortune was he lived in the time of Newton, and he and Newton were bitter enemies because Hooke was, everybody said that Hooke was hard to deal with, and he wanted to take credit for everything, including gravitation and, calculate, and calculus, and that pissed Newton off, okay? But Newton was more powerful, so Hooke didn't get as much credit as he perhaps should have. But he was, as a polymath, he was a terrific artist, he was an architect, he was a scientist, he built a terrific microscope with which he looked at many things, drew these beautiful pictures which you can see in the Huntington because they have an original copy of that book, Micrographia, he wrote. This was one of the first bestsellers, not one of the first scientific bestsellers, but one of the first bestsellers of any kind. And it really taught the man in the street about the really important role that science can have in society at the beginning of the Renaissance. Um, the next guy who was very important was Antoni von Leeuwenhoek, who developed not a two-lens microscope, but a simple single ball lens microscope. And he made hundreds of these microscopes, one of which is in the Huntington Library. And with this, he was able to see all the way down to the ability to see, by scraping some tartar off his teeth, the bacteria on his teeth. So we saw for the first time single-celled organisms. And people didn't believe him. They had to take a delegation from the Royal Society in London to come out to see it with their own eyes before they believed him. So he made discovery after discovery because he made the best lenses at that time. But the, for all of his accomplishments, I am still pissed at that guy because he was a secretive bastard. And the way he made those lenses, he made everybody believe he did it like everybody else by grinding the glass. But instead what he did is he would pull a piece of glass rod to make a thread, put that in a flame until it, until it balled up into a little ball, break that off, and that was his lens. And he kept that a secret because he wanted a lead. And it was going to be 150 years before anybody could make a microscope as good as his. And there was a lot of time lost because of that. So there are several problems that affect both astronomy and microscopy in this era. The first is that lenses do not focus different colors of light to the same point. That's called chromatic aberration. And so in astronomy, the way they dealt with this is it's not as strong as an effect if the focal length of the lenses was longer. So the best telescopes like Christian Huygens' telescope of that era used extremely long focal lenses where you'd have one of the lenses up on a flagpole on a universal joint and then a string to the other lens and you'd hold this crazy thing like this and try to look at what you wanted to see. 64 meters for this telescope. Okay, but with this, he was able to see the rings of Saturn and so forth. He had a resolution of about one arc second. It wasn't until the 90s that we got better resolution than that, but it was a bitch to work with, that's for sure. Um, so, so the other approach, of course, is rather than using lenses, is one can use curved mirrors to focus light. The inventor of that was Newton, and his original paper on that is in the Huntington Library. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so with that, things became much simpler because, because uh, those were quite easy to make. But there was a problem in that it's easy to grind a spherical um, indentation in a mirror. But what happens is with a spherical surface, again, all the rays don't come to one point. It needs to be an ellipse, and that's much harder to do. So this guy, John Hadley, he was a um, guy who invented the Oxtant. He was able to figure out a way of making an elliptical surface. And then all of a sudden, they had a, 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 now a telescope that's, that's one and a half meters long, but has the same performance of what, what uh, Huygens had to deal with much earlier. So then micro telescopes got better and better and bigger and bigger, and one of the greatest practitioners of this was William Herschel, who started off as a composer, but eventually 
got bit by the astronomy bug, started building his own telescopes, including you know, uh, uh, ones that were you know, well over a meter in size for the mirror. He was an incredibly dedicated guy. In that era, in order to make the mirrors reflective, they used this alloy called speculum, which would tarnish really easily. So what he would do is he would have a number of mirrors ready, and he would spend 16 hours a day going around in a circle on this mirror while his sister Carolyn fed him his meals, because if you take your hand off, you ruin the finish. And, so, and then he would go out in the evening and make his observations. But he, he discovered over 800 binary stars, 2,400 nebulae or dim sort of fuzzy looking structures in space. He really expanded our understanding of how deep and complex the universe was. An even bigger telescope was built uh, about 20 years later, 50 years later, but it was so massive and so difficult to use it didn't really get anywhere. It wasn't really until the 20th century when Caltech came on the scene, damn it, and started to really modernize astronomy that we got the Hooker telescope, which was the biggest telescope of its era, and the guy who was lucky enough to use it right away was Edwin Hubble. And with that, he was able to look at these Cepheid variable stars, which have a brightness which is directly proportional to their period of the oscillation of their brightness, and use that as a distance ruler. And at that time, this is the early 20th century, people did not know if the Milky Way was the entire universe or not, and if the Andromeda was within the Milky Way. But by looking at those Cepheid variables, he did his calculation, so it's over a million light years away. All of a sudden, the universe just became much vaster in people's minds. And that was because of Hubble doing his work right here at Mount Wilson. And then, of course, in 48, it was superseded by the HAL telescope at Palomar, which, of course, again, Caltech has had a huge role with. And for almost 50 years, it was the largest effective telescope. When I was in high school, I had all of these posters from the Hayden Planetarium up on my walls in my bedroom, dreaming about the day when I could hopefully come to Caltech and play a role in getting data like this. So, like I said, all of that was a nice progression, and people made bigger and better mirrors that allowed them to see more. Microscopy, like I said, was the retarded stepchild. Is that about 50 years after they figured out chromatic aberration and spherical aberration in astronomy, it was adapted in microscopy. But still, it was very hit and miss, and nobody had good, repeatable ways of doing things. So around 1850, Carl Zeiss was a microscope manufacturer. He built single-lens microscopes like Van Leeuwenhoek's for a while, but then wanted to make a compound microscope that would beat it and be as best as it could be. And so he started to build these microscopes. He sold about 1,000. And he was a damn difficult guy to work with, too. So he had a workshop of people. And he would go from microscope to microscope, do his own tests of performance. And if he didn't like it, he would take a hammer and smash it to pieces right in front of the workman that, he was, that was putting the damn thing together. And so in his frustration, he got uh, Ernst Abbe, a physicist at the local university, to start to look at the problem. And Abbe went through all of these calculations and figured everything out. And he said, well, if we make the lens grounded just to this diameter and this shape, and then we make four more lenses and we stick them together like this, and we make them out of all of these different materials, we will get the perfect lens. And in fact, what he discovered is the perfect lens won't give perfect resolution, but by the laws of physics, there was a limit to how small that you could see. And that limit in a, in a microscope was going to be about half of the wavelength of light that you use to create the image. So that's known as Abbe's law. The problem was is they put together these microscopes based on Abbe's calculations, and sometimes they worked, and oftentimes they didn't. And the problem was, as they found out, was the glass was not as good as what Abbe's theory uh, thought. So they hired a good chemist called Otto Schott, who developed new ways of making different types of glasses of incredible purity. And with that, they eventually got to this diffraction limit, which was exactly what Abbe predicted, about half the wavelength of light, or about 200 nanometers. And for the last century, then, the regular conventional optical microscope has been a workhorse of discovery. So that takes us now all the way up to the 1990s, OK? And so the HAL telescope was king for a long time. The regular optical microscope at the diffraction limit was king for a long time. But in the 90s, they both hit limits. And in, they hit the same physical limit first. 
And that problem is aberrations. Because if you want to look at the light from a distant star with your telescope, that would be great if we didn't have an atmosphere. But the atmosphere ends up warping all of the light rays, like this spoon inside of this glass of water. And so instead of having a flat wavefront that focuses to a point, you have an, uh, a warped wavefront that gives you a messy sort of spot. So your star ends up looking like this, like twinkle, twinkle little star. So it doesn't matter how good your telescope is because it's all messed up, all of the information before it even gets to your telescope. And so how are you going to deal with that? In fact, you know, it's so bad that although the HAL has tremendous light collection ability, a 10-inch reflector in your backyard can have the same seeing power if the aberrations are bad. And so it's like the water on your windshield screwing up the light. Well, the same problem happens in microscopy because if you want to look at anything more than, say, an isolated cell, if you want to look in real organisms, they have different refractive indices too. So as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you lose resolution and signal. And so you don't get anywhere near the diffraction limit on either the telescope side or the microscope side. So there are two ways of dealing with this problem. The first is get rid of the aberrations. In astronomy, that means putting your telescope in space, because then you're above the atmosphere, like the Hubble Space Telescope. And as you can see, this is what the HAL could see of the Crab Nebula, and this is what the Hubble can see. So tremendous, incredibly productive telescope over its lifetime. But there's challenges with this. First is that there's a limit to the size of the, of the mirror that you can put in the, the payload fairing of your rocket. And the second is that if you goof and you make a bad mirror like they did in the Hubble, then the service call is really freaking expensive. <laughs> so then you have to go and then uh, fix it, and then everything's great. Okay. And the Hubble has been, again, a workhorse of discovery like never before. At one time in 2003, they found a small little dim patch of sky where there wasn't any bright stars, and they stared at it for two weeks with the Hubble telescope to see what they would see. And the result, this ultra deep field, shows what you've got there. So this is looking 13 billion light years away at the edges of the universe, less than a billion years before the Big Bang, and it's just filled with galaxies. So now we think in the, there's about 100 billion galaxies with an average of 100 billion stars each, so about 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. So we can play that same game in microscopy of getting rid of the aberrations. If you take a dead sample, you can chemically treat it to make the refractive index homogeneous. That's called clearing. So Viviana Gradinaro, who's a professor here at Caltech, is an expert in this field. Um, this is a different method of clearing that we have been using with, uh, developed by a group, uh, Ed Boyden at MIT, and use this with a microscope we have, which has very high resolution volumetrically, to then look inside at a, at a subsection of the synapses inside of the brains of a mouse. And so what you're going to see when we turn on that pink, those represent little insulators that go around the axons that communicate from one nerve to another. And you can see how incredibly dense it is. This volume that I'm imaging here is one one millionth of the volume of a mouse brain, which of course is very small compared to a human brain. And so in humans, we have 100 billion neurons in our brain with 10,000 synapses each, or 10 to the 15th synapses in one human brain. Now, there are 10 to the, uh, 10 to the what, seven times 10 to the ninth humans on Earth. So collectively, humanity has 10 to the 22nd synapses, which is just as many stars as there are in the observable universe, okay? So, you know, there's, again, all the talk about AI and like that, and there's gonna be amazing things with this stuff. But still, the ability to understand or appreciate the complexity and the power of the human brain. It's gonna take a while before we ever get to something, I think, of this level of sophistication. So, all of that's fine, but the problems of space telescopes are you're really limited with how big of a thing you can put up there, and it's super expensive. And the problem with microscopy is you can only clear things if they're dead. So we need another solution to deal with these aberrations. And that solution is adaptive optics. 
So in this case, what people do is they shine a laser into high up into the upper reaches of the atmosphere where it excites sodium atoms to give off a little uh, fluorescent signal. That light creates sort of an artificial star which comes back into the telescope next to the thing that you actually want to see, but much brighter than the thing that you want to see. You bounce them off of a mirror, pick off the light from the artificial star, put it into a sensor, and then change the shape of a mirror to exactly balance the distortions that caused by the atmosphere. And then you get a flat wavefront and you get your good focus. So you go from this to this, or in the Keck telescope, which of course Caltech plays a big role in, you go from this to this for Saturn, and here you're able to actually, they've been able to actually watch stars orbiting the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy with adaptive optics. And in fact, because of course the Keck mirror being 10 meters is much bigger than the two and a half meter uh, Hubble mirror, you're able in the infrared to get better resolution than even the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, we can play, and in my lab, we play the exact same trip with, with microscopy. In fact, the very first time I heard about adaptive optics was long before it was even applied in astronomy. It was when I took a sophomore elective optics course here at Caltech, and Bill Bridges was teaching that class. He had worked for Hughes Research Corporation, and they, in the early 70s, had developed an adaptive optical system for laser weapons, where basically he showed a demonstration in class where he had this roiled atmosphere from a heater, he shot a laser through it, and then it would lock in on the bridge of the model of the Starship Enterprise and then follow it along as it was moving along. That affected me deeply. So, uh, as a Star Trek guy, definitely. And so that was always in the back of my brain, and I wanted to see, can we do the same thing and solve the problems of the aberrations in live samples with adaptive optics? So we do the exact same tricks. We create, use a laser to create an artificial guide star, in this case inside of a little fish. You can see without the adaptive optics, the resolution signal are poor. You turn it on, it all comes right back to the diffraction limit. So this is really kind of state of the art of what you can do in microscopy today. So all of that's fine, and now we actually got the diffraction limit from our ground-based telescopes and our microscopes in deep tissue. But then there's another problem. It's still a limit. They're still all limited by the size of the aperture. How can we see beyond those limits? So in astronomy, that's the basis of what's being done for exoplanet discovery, okay? So you need to use tricks. There's very few cases where the planets are far enough away and bright enough relative to the star that you can directly observe them in any telescopes we have today. So one of the tricks is, as the planet orbits the star, it tugs on the star a little bit, and some, it, so it goes in a circle, and sometimes it's going closer to the Earth and the light's a little bluer, sometimes it's going away and then it's a little redder. So that radial shift of Doppler shift is how you can tell that there's a planet tugging on it. Another method um, is that if the star actually, or if the planet eclipses its star, then there's a small dip in the signal that you get. From this, you can determine both the diameter of the planet and the diameter of the star, if the stars align, excuse the pun. And um, this is the Kepler Space Observatory, which has been an unwinking eye in space, looking at 150,000 stars for looking at these little dips. And it's been the champ in terms of finding the most exoplanets so far. So again, using a trick. How can we see beyond the diffraction limit of a microscope? Well, then we need to use another set of tricks. Remember, Abbe said there's this hard law that you can't see things smaller than half the wavelength of light. So what does this mean? Well, if this is the size of a protein molecule, then this big fuzzy blob is what that protein molecule would look like at the diffraction limit. Well, that's a pretty big problem because if we want to understand, one of the most fundamental questions is how do molecules self-assemble? They're inanimate, after all. How do they self-assemble to create this animate thing that can move and reproduce and do all of that that we call life? In order to understand that, we need to be able to see these things happening at the molecular level. And optical microscopy is really our only tool to do that because things like electron microscopy kill the cell. So, so how are we going to do that? 
Well, I think you'll all agree that even though there's a fizz, big fuzzy blob there, we can find the center, point to the center of that fuzzy blob to much better precision than the diameter of it. So if you look mathematically, and I showed this in the 90s when I was at Bell, that you can see single molecules and you can find their centers down to a few nanometers. The problem comes is when there's more than one molecule in any biological system, they're all crowded together, so all those fuzzy blobs make a mess. And then you're kind of stuck. Well, um, back in 2005, um, my buddy Harold Hess and I, we had both individually had failed in the business world and were both going through a midlife crisis and uh, both unemployed and looking for a new direction. And um, we went and visited Florida State University where we heard about a new type of fluorescent molecule. In normal fluorescent molecules, if you shine blue light on it, it glows green, end of story. In these photoactivated fluorescent molecules, you shine blue light on it, nothing happens. But if you shine purple light on it first, then you turn it to an active state, when it, then the blue light will make it glow green. So the light bulbs popped on our heads and we said, well, what if we turned down the violet light so low that only a few molecules popped on in the cell at a time? Then they would likely be separated by more than their fuzzy blobs. We could find their centers, turn those molecules off, turn on other ones, and go boom, 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 and then create an image that has resolution like this, photoactivated localization microscopy, instead of the diffraction limited image that looks like that. Well, we got really excited about this idea, but we were terrified too because, because we thought it was so damn easy. Why hasn't anybody done this already? We were terrified of being scooped. And so, um, you know, normally it would take far too long to get VC funding or write a grant or anything. But um, the good news is that Harold is much smarter than I am because when I left Bell, I told them to go to hell. And when Harold left Bell, they, he took all of his equipment with him. So. <laughs> So uh, we were able to pull that out of the storage shed and then put about 25K each of our own money in it. Now, normally you would do this kind of thing in some garage like Jobs and Wozniak, but we were fortunate enough to be able to do it in the living room because Harold wasn't married and it was a lot more comfortable <laughs> there. And so uh, in just a few months, with the help of uh, some folks at NIH, we were able to go. This is a cut through some lysosomes, which are sort of sort of a a garbage disposal inside of the cell. Um, this is the diffraction limit image, this is the palm image, and to better appreciate, you go from that to that. So the bottom line is, is that with palm, you can get you know, 10 times beyond the diffraction limit with a microscope you can build in your living room. So this took the world by storm, and eight years later, it led me to Stockholm to my vast surprise, but uh, that's that. Nowadays, we can do a lot better. So um, we can see in three dimensions many, many more molecules. So this is up to a billion molecules. We can look at live cells, although there's tremendous limits in doing live cell imaging with palm. But here's a great example by my colleague uh, James Liu at Genelia. These are the nuclei of two different cells. This is a normal cell looking at a protein, Huntington, which is involved in Huntington's disease. The one on the right has the mutation which causes that disease, and you see what happens is the protein forms these large aggregates inside of the nucleus that are stable. And if you zoom in on one of those aggregates, you see these little purple fireflies that get trapped in there like quicksand. They're known as transcription factors, and they're necessary so that the DNA can create RNA, which will then create proteins inside of the cell. So basically, we're able to link a disease to effects that are actually happening down at the single molecule level inside of your cells. So, so far I've given lots and lots of analogies about how we as microscopists have kept stealing from astronomers again and again. But there's one area where the analogy breaks down and you know, in planetary astronomy, things are evolving and like that, but on human time scales, most of the universe is a damn static place, okay? And so the, the difference is the thing that defines life is that it's animate. Every living thing is a pocket of reduced entropy through which matter and energy is flowing continuously. So the only way we're going to understand it is by having high resolution across all four dimensions of space and time at the same time. So how are we going to do that? Well, in about 2008, 
um, just a couple years after we started to do Palm, I got as thoroughly bored and as sick of it as I had of the previous things I had done in my career and gave it up. And I wanted to, you know, I really believed that live imaging was the future. Um, and I believed that, that could there be some way that we could improve microscopes for non-invasive 3D live imaging by that same order of magnitude that we did for the spatial resolution in Palm. And so that's what I set out as my goal. And ev eventually that led to something that we called the lattice light sheet microscope. So what it would use is these um, non-diffracting beams like what you have when you have a laser that reads across the barcode in the supermarket checkout. And so with those you can make a super thin sheet of light which the, you can drive your cell through very rapidly. And because the energy is spread out, the peak power is low, so it's very non-invasive. And then you can get very fast dynamics for very long periods of time, both by both metrics, an order of magnitude better than the live imaging techniques that preceded it. So I'm very proud of Palm. I'm very proud, I guess, to have won a Nobel Prize for it. But I know from the reception of the, of the biological community that this microscope will be the most important microscope that I ever make. Two things. Um, first off is, so where do we go from here? Well, in astronomy, it's got a very big future, right? Because, um, of course, Caltech is up to its eyebrows in the 30-meter telescope um, that they want to create, um, which, of course, will have nine times the uh, light collection ability and three times the resolution of the Keck telescopes. Europe, not to be outdone, is developing the extremely large telescope with almost a 40-meter mirror. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope should hopefully be launched in October of 2018, which will be the successor to the Hubble and go way out in deep space uh, on the other side of the Earth from the sun and uh, um, be, a, be, again, about a two and a half times the size mirror of the Hubble and look for very early events in the universe. And with adaptive optics now, the problem with adaptive optics in, micro, in astronomy is that typically you can only look over a small patch of the sky. But these newer telescopes will use arrays of lasers to create multi-conjugate adaptive optic systems to look over broad patches of sky. And then um, on the, on the uh, microscopy side, what we've done is we've been able to combine our lattice light sheet technology for high speed um, imaging in 3D with the adaptive optic technology. So now that we can actually study cells in their native state. Because my, 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 uh, my mission right now, or my, my, my vision, is that I was trained as a physicist. And as a physicist, um, we're taught about the observer effect. And whenever you look at a system, you affect your system. And so um, I'm concerned that we've never seen the cell in its native state. Most of what, bi what microscopy has taught us in biology has been lo by looking at isolated adherent cells on cover slips. And we know for certain they didn't evolve there. We also know that what we see, all of your cells have the same DNA. So why is a liver cell different from a cell in your eye? Well, it's because of the way genes are turned on and off inside of the cell. And that's a function of the local environment. So if you put your cells in an abnormal environment like a cover slip, you're not going to see the right phenotypes in that cell in the end. So by combining the adaptive optics with the lattice light sheet, we finally have the ability to see for the first time cells in their native state. And that's where I think the future is going to lie um, for cell biology. So finally, I'd like to conclude with two points. The first is that I hope you can see and are proud of the fact that your techers because in this 400-year history of development, the last hundred year, in the last 100 years, Caltech has had a disproportionately large role in the story of understanding both on the small end and the big end where we are today. And the other thing is how amazing it is, the other point, in 400 years, how far we've come from having just the knowledge that our own eyes give us to everything we know from, from the molecular to the submolecular, all the way up to the early moments of the Big Bang. In just 400 years of time, that's just, a, that's just nothing, a heartbeat in the course of humanity. 
And furthermore, when you look at what I said about the new microscopes coming online, there is not a better, more exciting time to be a scientist than today. We are blessed because of the onward march of technology to have new tools that will allow us to see the universe in the most beautiful, surprising, amazing ways. And I'm looking forward to what will come. Thank you very much.